All right, so first I want to thank everybody for coming here to this uh, Warrior Corner discussing an incredibly important topic. We're talking soldier lethality. Obviously, if you've paid attention to even the opening remarks of the AUS, AUSA conference, we're talking about ready, ready today and more lethal tomorrow. And soldier lethality is now. That's one of the key messages I want to leave you here uh, from the cross-functional team on soldier lethality, that soldier lethality efforts are occurring as we speak with the first uh, visible fieldings of soldier lethality efforts occurring in this fiscal year, uh, which, is, which is pretty important. This is uh, moving at a pretty rapid pace. So by way of introductions, uh, I'm Dave Hodney. Uh, assume responsibilities of this uh, cross-functional team on the 4th of September. Uh, so with about 35 days on the job, I'm fully prepared to answer any and all questions you might have pertaining to soldier lethality. I say that because I've been a career infantryman for, for, for 27 years. And when you talk about passion and fielding, and, and if you were in uh, General Milley's remarks today during the Eisenhower luncheon, if you didn't walk out excited, one, to be in our Army or be around our Army, and field capability that's going to make this entire Army more lethal, you're, you're probably in the wrong business. So that's point one I'll make. Um, second, the cross-functional teams and everything about them are team efforts. So that's why I asked uh, Breeder General Tony Potts. He's my wingman and the program executive officer, PEO soldier. And uh, a lot of the capabilities that, that I'm interested in is the soldier lethality CFT directly fall under Tony's portfolio. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why he's here on this panel with me. And we're gonna, we're gonna discuss that in a little more detail. I've also included uh, Travis Thompson. He's my deputy for the CFT but he's also the TRADOC capability manager for soldier systems. So as you look at the CFT and how it's organized around uh, personnel and critical billets, we've got the TRADOC capability manager, the program executive officer, and the infantry commandant, all of whom have equities in everything we're doing with soldier lethality. So that's, that's why we're organized the way we are. And I do wanna, you know, as I walk through the, 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 the vendor displays and I you know, walk, roam the hallway here at AUSA, this is an important topic to have because not everyone interprets or understands lethality in the same context. And I'm gonna cover that in a little bit when I talk about the lines of effort that we cover within the cross-functional team, but it's not solely about weapons. Lethality is about a whole bunch of other things. And for anyone who's moved with an infantry squad and has had pounds of, of, of equipment piled on top of them, where they move like turtles, and all those kinds of things, you could say that squad is clearly not lethal because of how we've approached manning or organizing and equipping that squad. So that's, there's a lot more to it. It's not just about um, weaponry and lethality and from that perspective, energy at target. It's also about mobility, it's about human performance, it's about training and all those other sorts of things. So if we go to the next slide, and when I talk what is soldier lethality, I'm gonna start with uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army's quote, there on the right. That was direct, direct uh, from last year's Army modernization priorities. And that's what governed the immediate work that the Soldier Lethality CFT began. So General Milley talks about shooting, moving, and communicating, which is no, that's, that's nothing new to the infantryman or the close combat soldier. That's, that's, that's always been the case. They have to shoot, move, and communicate. He also asked protecting, sustaining. He talks about human performance. He also talks about synthetic training environment. We're joined here by the synthetic training environment cross-functional team director as well, Major General Maria Gervais. Um, that's, that's absolutely important. And the simulation capability and what Secretary Mattis would describe is the 25 bloodless battles that occur in training long before we introduce soldiers uh, in, in, into, com into close combat. So that's important. Again, this was one year ago. This year's theme building on the momentum established last year, ready today, more lethal tomorrow. And as we think about soldier lethality, just quotes from this conference I want to share to frame, frame the context. General Milley yesterday in the opening ceremony, the soldier is the most lethal weapon system in the U.S. Army arsenal. The soldier is the most lethal weapon system in the ar arsenal of the U.S. Army. General McConville, everything we do as an Army including modernization, starts with a soldier. And it's easy to sometimes lose sight of that when you're surrounded by systems of equipment and gear and all those kinds of things and understand everything, that, everything that's, 
that's in this pavilion is, is going to be in the hands of a soldier, operated and touched uh, by soldiers. Even the unmanned systems will be under the supervision of, of soldiers and leaders. And then General Murray yesterday talked about today's modernization is tomorrow's readiness. And that's absolutely the way we approach this. But I really liked the metric that he described. The only metric that matters is more lethality. And that's why we're here. The only metric that matters is delivering more lethality. Status quo is not good enough. And frankly, status quo puts us at risk. And if you have that approach that, oh, we have good enough systems, shame on you as we move forward. That's certainly not the approach we're going to take. While I, while I covered uh, General Milley's quote here, I want to draw your attention to the soldier on the left side of that screen. What you see there is an NCO from the 82nd Airborne Division. Notice he's in daytime. I know some of you, that should, that should be obvious. It's at daytime, and he's wearing goggles. He's wearing the enhanced night, night vision goggle binocular, which should be the first system introduced. It'll be introduced this year with our first unit equipped. That's a day-night thermal-capable system. Game changer. And those are his words, not mine. This system's a game changer. It's the, the, the combination of image intensification with a digital thermal fusion that occurs inside that goggle that provides them, you know, unparalleled advantage. That's from a sergeant. The other reason I want to highlight that is soldier touch points and how we're organized to test our equipment as opposed to the requirements developed. It goes over to the PEO and then years down the road we see that requirement and it it goes through, it certainly will go through tests, but how we organize these tests in close concert with Forcecom, with ATEC, with JMC, and all those, all those agencies, but most importantly, uh, the Forcecom commander has been personally engaged in making sure we have the right soldiers, the right units at the right time in their training, so we're getting soldiers who have experience in that and are going to give us the positive feedback on that, not systems that are provided to units there eventually we get you know, garbage in, garbage in type feedback where they're tasked to look at something, but they weren't fully prepared to test these in, in the wide range of environments. Again, daytime in the snow, working on a first ever system uh, fielded. So partnership in the field is very important to the soldier lethality cross-functional team. And uh, I just wanted to make sure I communicated that. Let's go to the next slide. So I covered the what. Now I'm going to cover the why soldier lethality. This is going to be a review for some of you that have been part of this journey for the last year, but I, I want to highlight, draw your attention to the center of the screen. It talks about, you know, 4% of the DOD is, is in the close combat task force and assumes 90% of our casualties since World War II. It also highlights that less than 4% of the science and technology budget has been afforded to, to developments in this arena. So that's important. The NDS uh, for 2018 was very clear. It directs, specifically, develop a more lethal joint force. And it directs us to do this in a manner that goes beyond material. And I covered that already. It's not solely about equipment put in the hands of the soldiers. It's about a whole host of other, other arrangements. You know, the, the, the multiple lines of efforts of the National Defense Strategy uh, included, you know, one, first line of effort, building a more lethal force. That's very clear. The second one was strengthening alliances, but the third was reforming DO Department of Defense business practices for greater performance and affordability. And that's again why Tony Potts and I are connected closely as well as, a few, as, as other PEOs and, and our research development engineering centers and all those sorts of things to help, help me go about our business. In the end, our, our goal throughout this process, starting with documents like the National Defense Strategy, the National Security Strategy, the Army vision, the Army strategy that General uh, Milley unveiled through model, modeling and simulations against, against threats that, uh, that uh, we want to address, identifying the resulting gaps and opportunities ultimately allow us and the cross-functional team to prioritize efforts and ultimately develop requirements to win on the battlefield. And that's the why we're doing what we're doing. So in order to win, I'm next going to discuss how we do this. Next slide, please. So how you go about implementing change, how you go about implementing a plan, it all starts with task organizing. It's about building the organization and putting the right agencies in place. And this is no different than how we achieve successes overseas, downrange, or any, any other place where we're, we're introducing uh, Army soldiers in close combat. 
And uh, what you see at the top is, is, or at the center is the cross-functional team, the core members of Fort Benning in the, in the, in the new Futures Command uh, table of distribution and allowances is about 25 personnel assigned to me at Fort Benning and, and, and with other locations, including NSR deck and a few other locations uh, like Picatinny and so on. But the rest of the strength of the cross-functional team comes from the matrix members that reside all outside Fort Benning. That's, that's, that's key for this. So you can see it around the whole slide. The capability developers that still reside in the Maneuver Center of Excellence that will report to Army Futures Command, they certainly have helped us. And I gotta give them the credit where the, where the soldier lethality CFT is right now, essentially were requirements that we were able to accelerate that those teams had already identified, in some cases, five to seven years ago. That because of what uh, the, the teamwork that you see on this slide here, we were able to organize quick, quickly, and uh, because in the end, it's not solely a money problem that solves some of these quick wins. In a lot of cases, how we organize, how we man, and how we communicate and network with each other to make sure we can achieve achieve shared goals in this. Um, you can see costing, the intelligence community, informing our threats, informing our modeling, informing our simulation, informing our capabilities, frankly, is, frankly, is really important. We communicate and partner with uh, other CFTs. In the year that the CFTs have been in place as part of this, you know, the, the Army's level of organizing how to win, in the year that uh, the CFTs have been in place, We've already identified the areas of horizontal integration in and amongst the CFTs themselves. Network uh, efforts across the CFTs, how we communicate with the soldier and all the way through those other systems. The synthetic training environment I've already discussed. The capabilities that we're trying to field that gives you know, virtual and augmented reality rehearsal options to soldiers, certainly something that we've partnered closely with the synthetic training environment uh, cross-functional team to do that. Um, I'm very proud of our partnership with the science and technology uh, community. The Soldier Lethality CFT partners closely with the NATO Soldier uh, Systems Research Development. Mr. Doug Tamilio joins us here today. We also uh, partner with Dr. Don Riego at CERDEC, um, and we partner with the, with the team, obviously, Picatinny Arsenal and RDEC to help us, help us achieve our Soldier Lethality efforts. I know they're partnered closely with industry and academia. And then, of course, the, you know, what, what we've discussed yesterday, the CFTs, Army Futures Command, and our role in balancing requirements and acquisition is absolutely essential to this whole process. And you can see our, our connections with the PEO soldier and PEO ammo. And I'll turn it over to Tony Potts if he has any comments on, on that aspect of it. Hey, Dave, thanks. So <clears throat> you know, we get a lot of questions about what, what's different today than it was yesterday, right? So my responsibilities as a PEO remain the same. I am responsible for, uh, if I have milestone decision authority that's come down from Dr. Jetty, I'm responsible to execute that. But I'm also responsible through my PMs to deliver capability. Truly what, one of the great powers of this, uh, this partnership and teaming, and Dave Hodney is an absolutely fantastic partner in this entire venture, is it's really this unity of effort. Uh, there's no PEO that has the capacity in and of themselves to go out and do all the engagements that really need to be done to bring this together as an enterprise. So these, these, these CFT, the, these directors, really truly, they bring the entire enterprise together. We used to call PMs the building briefing officers. They spent all their time trying to get everybody to yes. Uh, and that, that added weeks and months, uh, you know, sometimes I would even say years to the process. Today, what happens is you have, the, you have the, the, the CFTs really out there underneath the power of an AFC, a four-star command, who really are focusing the Army's priorities. When you focus the Army's priorities, that means you're focusing Army resources. Uh, you are focusing the agencies that are involved in this all on what really matters. Now, when you do that, I will tell you, you take a lot of pressure off of the acquisition community to go out and do those things. That, the unity of command, the unity of effort is there, then it allows us the freedom. And I will t tell you the other thing, with, with our senior leadership in our Army today, one of the things that we see is the ability to be, it's less risk averse. Now, don't, don't take that as irresponsible spending of dollars. It means that we are innovating with a purpose. We are taking prudent risk that I will tell you in years past, and I've, I've done this acquisition thing about 23 years, 32 years in the Army, I've seen senior leaders now be willing to accept that there is a, it's okay to go out and fail early. None of my partnerships have changed. None of the people that I connect with have changed. 
I just got to have a great partner here. And by the way, we, we do it with almost all of the, the CFT leads through Soldier. Uh, we, we tend to be one of those areas that really truly lends ourselves uh, to the AFC CFT construct because we have such fast turn cycles. We really have the ability to do things faster and differently for our soldiers, for our war fighters. Uh, and then one of the things, I don't know if Dave's going to talk about it, and if not here, we'll talk about it later, um, is really about the architecture of the soldier itself. So Dave and I have partnered on this, and then General Gervais, because what we truly believe is if we can architect the soldier very similar to the way we architect an aircraft, to do the engineering, if we can do it the same way uh, that we do a vehicle. And we really, we control space, weight, power, power demand. If we can do those things for a soldier, then we can start to turn capability at the speed of industry and at the speed of technology. But it really takes a partnership uh, with our CFT leads to drive those things to fruition. So Dave, thanks. Thank you, Tony, appreciate that. So, and that partnership ultimately can result in an effort, some acceleration of efforts in some cases by anywhere between two and five years. Pretty incredible stuff. If we go to the next slide. This is the second slide on, on the how. How are we going to develop requirements in order to win? And it's essentially viewing the squad as a system. So again, you look around this impressive uh, venue here. You can see a striker with a 30 millimeter cannon. You can see future vertical lift options out there that, and, that everyone can see and touch. And how many seats are in that thing? How many soldiers can that carry? How fast does it go? All those kinds of things. What you don't see on the floor is a rifle squad standing in two fire team wedges with equipment, with bandwidth that's you know, communicating their inner squad wireless you know, mission command requirements. You don't see a placard that says, how much weight have we hung on this squad? You don't see a placard that says, what is the battery power required to feed that fire control mechanism, the night vision or enhanced night vision goggles to feed their radios? all those sorts of things. You don't see a squad. So we've got to view, just like our tanks, our next generation combat vehicles, and even uh, we had to throw an F-35 system in there. Like any other system, we've got to view the squad in that, and, and we've got to develop our requirements, even internal to the cross-functional team, and identify those dependencies. So when we develop you know, a, a goggle solution or a weapon integrated fire control solution, the power requirements aren't so in such demand that we've added excessive amount of weight to our soldiers. So that's really important. So that's the first principle, treat them as an integrated combat platform. We're also gonna field some capabilities that are not gonna go to the entire army. They're gonna go only to the close, what we call the close combat 100,000. 100,000 soldiers, about 65,000 11 Bravo riflemen, 8,000 11 Charlie Mortarmen, 11,019 Delta Cav Scouts, about 3,500 68 Whiskey Combat Medics, and 4,500 12 Bravo Combat Engineers. Those are those five MOSs that com com comprise the Close Combat Lethality um, Task Force or the Close Combat Soldiers that we're going to field with this equipment. That allows us, because normally when you do things at scale in an army is when you reach, reach unaffordable solutions. In this case, developing soldier lethality for the soldiers who need to um, close with and destroy the enemies of our country are the ones that are gonna, gonna benefit from this, from this capability. We're certainly collaborating with our partners internal to the Army and also our joint partners. Uh, the Marine Corps certainly is, is a, a lot of equities in, in soldier lethality initiatives as well as uh, Special Operations Command. I already talked our uh, uh, user evaluations and soldier touch points and uh, we're certainly linked in with uh, Secretary Mattis's uh, Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Go to the next slide, please. And this will be my last sli slide on the how. The Joint Staff, so walking into the Soldier Lethality CFT, General Donahue left last year's AUSA convention with General Milley's modernization priority guidance, which was the slide I showed you with uh, General Milley's quotes. Over the year, how we've refined our lines of effort are listed here on this slide, and this was approved as our Soldier Lethality Initial Capabilities document was approved by the Joint Staff this summer. And uh, essentially, these are our lines of effort. Line of effort one, lethality is obvious. Soldier lethality is the sum total of each of these lines of effort. 
Lethality is obviously, uh, you know, weapons, munitions, fire control. It's also tied to soldier experience and training uh, as you go through how we do lethality. Mobility is important. Armor is not solely a function of protection. Armor is also a function of being able to move under that protection. The soldier who can't move, a soldier who can't shoot, move, and communicate is not as lethal as the soldier who can move freely on the battlefield. So that's something that Tony Potts and I have been talking with his soldier protection and individual equipment program managers, and that's really important. I know uh, NSR decks looking at uh, exoskeleton technology and augmentation and you know, there's other, other items like area delivery to reduce, reduce the load on, on squads. And I already talked tactical power solutions that help, help soldiers, you know, move longer over distance with less weight in, uh, in batteries. Communications, while the network CFT is one of those horizontal integrating efforts with General Gallagher and, and his team, there's the intra-squad communications that's integrated into, into the soldier lethality efforts that's certainly, certainly under our purview. Situational awareness contributes directly to lethality. And those are some of the, the, the night vision goggle I described. That, that ENVGB for that soldier in the 82nd Airborne Division, and out of that, coming out of that soldier touch point, 100% improvement in uh, M4 qualification using that ENVGB. 300% increase in detection of targets in day and night environments when, when outfitted with that enhanced night vision goggle binocular, and 30 to 50% less, less time to required to employ their weapon because of the sum total of all those efforts. That's, that's absolutely in every way contributing to soldier lethality. I talk protection, and uh, I'm certainly appreciative of what Tony Potts and his team are doing in the realm of uh, soldier protection in terms of body armor and also head protection and helmet technology, some of which you saw during yesterday's opening ceremonies worn by that squad that was in front of the chief. And then survivability, signature management, not just in terms of what the decks are doing in terms of um, you know, camouflage and concealment, but also in terms of the you know, suppression on our weapon systems and all those sorts of things. And then lastly, training and human performance. Uh, Chris Donahue on his watch is the first soldier lethality cross-functional team director and the infantry commandant and you heard General Milley mention it multiple times. You know, we implement, we're implementing right now the pilot company, uh, two companies of, uh, that started with uh, 200 soldiers each, infantry one station unit training, the, the, the most significant overhaul of infantry one station unit training since 1971, extending that, uh, that course from 14 weeks to 22 weeks. And it's not solely time, time to train, it's also uh, covering some skills that weren't previously covered under the 14-week one-station unit training training program. So that's something we're certainly proud of and absolutely contributes in every way to soldier lethality. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Tony Potts if he's got any other closing comments, and I think we'll be available for questions. So, it, you know, we, in the end, we're, we're going to figure out, you know, how do we work together and partner, you know, our, our industry partners, you know, with us. Uh, I've seen uh, my PMs standing back in the back, so from soldier weapons uh, to, to the soldier warrior guys to the new IVAS PM, uh, Lloyd is here for SSL. But we are collectively a team. Uh, Dave Hodney really guides this ship. Um, we are looking at a lot of how do you innovate. Uh, we have stood up at PO Soldier with Dave. We've stood up what we call the Innovation 300 Center. Uh, we invite our industry partners in to work with us on innovation and running innovation sprints. Uh, when folks have good ideas, it's okay that the ideas maybe didn't, didn't come from me, and I think Dave's okay if it didn't come from him. We just care about what gives our soldiers greater, cap greater capability. We take those in. Uh, we will rapidly prototype those type of things uh, based on the budget and the thing that we have, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll look at the art of the technically possible. Uh, and then I, you know, Dave comes back and, and you know, working with the chief, working with whoever, says, listen, this is a capability we want, and then we just go to go look and maybe we write the requirement that way. Sometimes we go the other way. We say, no, this is the requirement I gotta have, and we gotta press industry, and we gotta press technology to get us to that point. So, they're going to go in both directions nowadays. And so we want you to know uh, from an industry perspective, we want to partner with you. We want you to partner with us. Uh, talk to the PMs. Uh, talk to me, uh, our chief engineer, as we develop the soldiers and integrated weapons platform as a system. Uh, we are interested in what you have to say. And with that, uh, Dave. I guess Pam's going to help us with
Can we... Any questions? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you for doing this. Uh, Matthew Cox, military.com. I had a question on the uh, next generation squad weapon. Um, okay, so and I asked this to the chief uh, yesterday. Um, so last week you, you guys put out a, a draft solicitation talking about uh, future prototype opportunities and also uh, follow on contracts for uh, vendors to, to put out, you know, uh, at 150,000, you know, of, of these weapons and, um, you know, so much ammunition. And uh, what I wanted to ask, I guess, if you could clear up is over the summer, the, you know, there was an announcement about five companies that were, you know, identified to do prototypes for the next generation squad automatic rifle. Um, just did those tie into this? You know, could you talk about what happened? You know, did you look at the prototypes for those? And then your, some of them moved forward. But General Miller really, he, he didn't speak to it. So, so that's a good question. And so I get uh, Colonel Kagan's back there smiling. So Colonel Kagan's is the PM for uh, soldier weapons. And he, he, can, he can take later what I said and say what the general really meant to say was this. Uh, but, but here's, so, I, so we did have the first prototype opportunity to notice it went out. We did award to five companies, six prototypes that are going to be, those are due in June. And we're going to take a look and we're evaluating those along the way. Uh, I keep looking back at Elliot as long as his head's doing this. I'm good to go. So that's what's happened. Now, what we've decided is because what the Army truly wants is we want a common cartridge. So what we're taking a look at now, and so last week we, we issued what we call a draft prototype opportunity notice. And really we're trying to get the industry's feedback on this because what, we've, what we really said, and by the way, this came from some feedback we got from industry to start with. It said, hey, when we're doing engineering changes to come to a common cartridge, it would be better if we were doing the engineering on both the automatic rifle and the rifle concurrently. If you do it to maximize the AR, you may get a common round that's bigger, heavier than you really want for a rifle. If you maximize it for the rifle, you may get one that's a little bit too small, doesn't quite have the power you want in your automatic rifle. So if we do them concurrently, now the engineering trade-offs will optimize, maximize that common cartridge for both the AR and the rifle. That's what we're really looking for, is getting to that common cartridge uh, to come out and what the best way is for us to get that common cartridge. So now industry is going to have an opportunity to come back and talk to us off the draft notice. Uh, we will have a uh, industry day in November uh, sometime. I, I don't have the exact date. I know Elliot and them will, but, but it's out there as part of the pond. So we can talk to industry. Uh, it'll be open forum, plus industry partners will have the opportunity to ask us for a private session if they want to talk to us about things that they think might be a little bit sensitive to do in an open forum so we can get the best feedback, so we can really put out the best pawn to get the best capability. And then, so the, then the, the prototypes then from the five companies, you said they're due next June? Uh, they are due June of 2019. 2019, okay, yes. thank you. We got one. There we go. Thank you for letting me hold the mic. Um, one thing that y'all talked about was this pace of overhaul is going to rapidly accelerate. As it said on the slide, you're looking at an overhaul of equipment roughly every seven years with the advance of technology. How are y'all looking to feed back that back into training and doctrine as the capabilities that y'all are giving to soldiers are shifting so rapidly? That's a, that's a great question. So, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm currently the only cross-functional team director that is dual-hatted both in my training and doctrine command responsibilities as the infantry commandant and as the cross-functional team director for soldier lethality. So as the infantry commandant, General Lundy tasked me to be, you know, dom you know, dominate my space in the infantry in terms of doctrine, training, leader development, and personnel. 
as the cross-functional team director, I clearly delve in the realm of material, which the other combinants don't generally have to manage because the, the CDIDs under the centers of excellence, you know, honcho that. Also per policy, the other P in the Dotmo PFP. But that material is absolutely, this, this, this new rifle, you know, will exceed the capacity of some of our ranges, a lot of our ranges out, in, uh, out on the installations. So now I'm not only delving in the realm of training and how we incorporate that new capability, but I'm also dealing with facility you know, initiatives and all those kinds of things. There's other ways around it, reduce range ammunition and all those kinds of things that can mitigate, mitigate all that, but it's absolutely linked um, to the point where the, and, you know, I won't speak for the other CFTs, but I know, you know the tie between General Esperance and General Kaufman is, is, is significant for the same same relationships um, that will help us. Every one of these is absolutely integrated uh, across the board. There's training, you know, that obviously goes into fielding new weapons, new situational awareness, using the enhanced night vision goggle binocular in daytime is going to be a training thing. And uh, that's something that we're going to absolutely, ha absolutely have to incorporate into that. We're informed throughout those soldier touch points on how we can, you know, address those training impacts based on feedback from, from incredible soldiers that are touching that equipment. But that's a, that was a good question. Thank you. And, and I think General Gervais would probably love a bite at that apple because really we are really working to build systems where we fight, rehearse, and train all with the same system. What you generally find is if a soldier has to carry something additional to the battlefield, they will not carry that additional something if it is a training device. So as we look at these kind of uh, initiatives, what we're trying to do is make sure uh, for ENVGB, for instance, we are actually looking at uh, training materials that would actually, you would use the exact same device uh, is you would. So we don't want to create a separate training device for an ENVGB. We simply want the ability to fight with the system, rehearse with the system, train with the system. And as long as we do that, soldiers will get the training to rehearse that Dave's talking about. Oh, we got one more question. I think this is the last question. Uh, Doug Wampler with Booz Allen. So the Global Force Management Data Initiative out of the Joint Staff for CDDs talks about measuring readiness at the billet and the crew level. So have you thought about how you can actually measure readiness and the lethality of crews and squads below the AA level currently in USR as OSD redefines readiness so you're able to assess and measure the relative lethality across crew, squads, um, and units, et cetera? Sure. No, that's a, that's a good question. So. The short answer is, uh, I know Doug Tamilio and his team at NSR deck are examining some things. General Carrillo, when he was at the 82nd Airborne Division, asked exactly that question. And I don't, I don't have immediate reach on the acronym, but the program was Mastery, um, which was a program that was implemented at the 82nd. You know, sensors, um, you know, sample, you know, all, all sorts of things that would inform the status of a soldier. Um, I know they just did the first evolution of data collection on that, and I just had my science and technology review on that, and the scientist responsible for the program you're, you're, you're asking about um, didn't have the immediate feedback for me. So I can't tell you exactly um, how it ties into the performance triad or how they address those sorts of things. I know some of the things we're looking at for um, some of our other systems would similarly inform you know, biometric data and all those sorts of things to inform folks on, on, on how the squad's doing. Travis, I think, has a comment. So, so what I would add is that what you also identify is how do you measure lethality at the squad level? So that's not just important from the how do you do it for the you know, USR and how do you say how many squads are to TPU, but it's also important for how you measure it and what capabilities you go after. So it gets to our modeling and SIM effort, which in this area is largely, uh, there's a lot of work, but it's very disconnected and it's very disjointed. And so we, we have to define. So part of that definition that General Hodney showed of you know, what the chief described it, 
that sum capability is what we're trying to get after. Now we have to figure out how, which measurements start to tell us that, whether you're starting to find out that a weapon that's a little bit heavier actually starts to reduce collective performance. That body armor that increases, that may be lighter, but increases the risk from a protection standpoint, actually increases the squad performance because now they have more mobility and they can actually maneuver on the battlefield and defeat the enemies faster. So we've not had a very good model of how to do that from modeling and sim, nor have we had a very good way to then be able to show that for commanders in the field to be able to use. And that combined effort is an ongoing one that uh, I probably get beat up on daily. I think it's fair to say it, it's a big problem for the Army, and it's because humans are all different. And so the reality is it, we're not going to have a perfect model. It's taken a long time to get to the ones we have for helicopters and vehicles, but we have to do it for the soldiers. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there, but efforts in S&T, uh, where we're working with industry and academia are gonna help uh, to get to those solutions quick. And the initial models will be rough and then they'll be refined over time. So, yes, sir. And I, the last thing I'll close with is that's, your question is exactly something Secretary Mattis is, is uh, you know, razor focused on as well, or laser focused on, and he's directed uh, Mr. Latois at the Close Combat Lethality Task Force to look at exactly those sorts of things. So. Hey, I want to thank you getting close. Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick on that. So, because we do actually have a human performance lead under what we have stood up the assistant PEO for futures and integration, our PO soldier. Uh, again, working, you know, th this is working with Dave Hodney and the team, and it really is about getting after the things Travis has talked about. So, we have a leap A course, we have a mastery course, uh, we have a lot of courses where we can put kit on soldiers, run them, and, and understand. We understand what their PT scores are, we understand what their mar rifle marksmanship scores are. There's a lot of things we understand. Uh, so I've got one of my other PMs back here, Colonel Snyder. He's, he's getting ready to embark on another program that, that uh, Congress just funded for us, uh, improved visual augment, or uh, good, good grief, uh, the integrated visual uh, augmentation system. And so, but part of that that we are using on there, it's, there is going to be a human performance measure where we're going to be starting to use AI and machine learning to collect this and to learn from this. And then working with General Gervais and her team at, uh, you know, as far as the, uh, at the STE, um, because what we want to do is not only learn exactly how the performance is, we want from an AI perspective and an ML perspective to be able to feed that back into the things that General Gervais is working for uh, the STE environment, to be able to start creating scenarios, automatically creating scenarios, and I see my battle buddy Mike Sloan over here, PEO Stry, to create battle uh, simulations based on a squad's lethality to start taxing that squad, understanding where their weaker points are, creating scenarios that generate a better fit squad for those particular things. And to predict the resilience, we're gonna look at, you know, Doug Tamilio, my partner back here from NSR deck, we're talking about human performance. So we're looking at the resilience of a soldier, right? Every soldier has a different engine, they have different cognitive capabilities. And Doug is his, and his team up at NSR deck are studying those, and we are bringing those into the AI models as well. So like, like Dave said, this is really a big emphasis from uh, the SEC DEF, so, uh, the, the Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Uh, and for the first time, we are really starting to get after uh, the, the, the metrics for performance of a soldier. So great question. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.